You know, I find it uh, rather peculiar that you have people in the world saying, you know, we look at news going on everywhere, we all have beliefs and issues about what's going on in the world. We criticise others that don't get involved. And then when you do get involved, you got these small-minded people that go, your opinion doesn't count, you're not even a local. And it's like, oh, <laughs> these people are ridiculous. See, there's rather this possessiveness around that, uh, you know, there are so many that I've heard, well, not so many, too many, that have said, this person hasn't got any reason to be even saying what she's saying because she's not even a local, she doesn't even live here. Well, guess what? Most of the things that go wrong in this world are not right outside my front door. They are not part of my life. Am I apathetic? Do I turn a blind eye to the plight of my fellow man in the neighbour next door, in the community next door, in the continent, continent next door? No. You know, the way that you look at all of your fellow man, we are all connected. And if I turn my back on where I see a problem, well, would you encourage people that um, try to stop all the uh, poverty in third world countries, that all, all their efforts outside of their own home and their own local area, would you shut them down too? Would you say to them that the only things that you can worry about are those things that are happening to you? that you should be so self-absorbed and so selfish as to not give a damn about your whole fellow man? Well, you see, I laugh at people like that that say that you've got no right to say it because you're not a local. I've got every right to say it. I'm a human being living on this planet. Full stop. So now I've said that, let's get on to a couple of other subjects I want to cover here today. The first one is about Cannabis Industries Australia. Now I've been reading through a, a transcript of a um, court hearing in which Philip Dixon actually appeared and he was talking about Cannabis Industries Australia. Now he swore under oath that Yes, if you don't know who Dolph Cook is, this is Dolph Cook over here. I've introduced him in previous videos. He's also noted on the NCV Enterprises Planet document as being co-owner with Peter Van Leishout and Darko Kovac of one of the land parcels that is part of the whole Nightcap Village or NCV Enterprises development. All those thousands of acres includes uh, the Cannabis Industries Australia that, um, well, I'll get into them in a minute, but uh, Dolph Cook is actually the one that is more involved with the Cannabis Industries Australia than any of them. And why? Because Dolph Cook has an industrial hemp licence. And up at the uh, Cannabis University, the or the Cannabis, sorry, up at Dolph Cook's property that is mentioned as part of the Nightcap on Mingenbull development, he is associated with the Cannabis University and also promoting the medicinal use of cannabis. Now he has an industrial license, not a medical license. And based on that industrial license where, well, would you like to get the um, old hemp ropes that they tied ropes up with to try and heal yourself with? Because that's the kind of quality between medical and industrial. But Philip Dixon is in court and he's talking about this, sworn under oath. And when it was brought up about... Um, Dolph Cook's license 
that it was an industrial license, not a medical one. Philip Dixon just said, well, you know, hemp's hemp. It's like, oh, you twit. No, it's not. You've set everything up around promoting it as medical usage and medicinal, not industrial. And just as a FYI, if there was no difference, there wouldn't be different names for it. Okay? There's an industrial hemp license and there's a medical hemp license. So, you bloody dickhead, of course there's a difference. But you know that. And he actually swore in court that, eh, you know, hemp's hemp. But that's not the only thing he swore in court. He swore that uh, Dolph Cook was no longer a director of cannabis industries. Asked further on about it, he sort of ummed and ahed around it and said, well, he said he didn't want to be in it anymore. And it's like, um, mate, you are a director of the company and you're going to tell me that when you're testifying in court, you don't know what's going on? Well, now the reason I'm bringing this up is, well, there's a, a few reasons. But um, word has it around the place that Dolph has told people that he got out of Cannabis Industries Australia. Well, that actually isn't the case. What Philip Dixon said in court last year, that Dolph Cook is no longer a director of Cannabis Industries Australia, that was incorrect. And as a director, knowing exactly what's going on in Cannabis Industries Australia, that cannot be a mistake, but a deliberate lie. So yes, I am saying that Philip Dixon perjured himself on his testimony around Cannabis Industries Australia. Can I prove what I say? Well, over here we've got an extract that was from the 5th of August 2020 and there have been no documents lodged since then. Now we go down to the current office holders and who do we see? Uh, I might tell you too that the date of registration was the 23rd of March 2017 as noted here as the start date of Dolph Cook and Philip Dixon. Oh, well, actually, it was a little bit earlier than that, sorry. Yeah, it was a, a month after. Because if you look at it, the 15th of February was the start date. It started with directors Adrian Brannock, Mark Darwin, Dolph Cook and Philip Dixon. So there was all four of them. And then, um, well, there was three of them to begin with, um, which was Adrian Brannock, Mark Darwin and Philip Dixon. They started it up. They needed Dolph Cook with his industrial hemp license so they could flog it off as a medical hemp license and, oh, look, there's no difference. So about a month after, they brought Dolph Cook in as a director and he's also a shareholder. Now, if you look here at the cessation of shareholders, you will see that everything was changed when Dolph came in. Adrian Brannock had just set up his company, Nyepi. Mark Darwin's partner had just uh, set up her company, Loved Ones Tribe. And Philip Dixon had just set up well, Dixon Rainmaker. So at the time they bought in Dolph Cook, they also changed their shares out of their name and into their company names. Adrian Brannock into Nyepi, Mark Darwin into Loved Ones Tribe, which is in Caroline Coman's name, and Dixon Rainmaker, which is all Philip Dixon. So that is who currently holds all the shares in the company. Dolph, Adrian Brannock, Mark Darwin, Philip Dixon. They just changed them out into different company names. So 
not only is Dolph Cook uh, a shareholder of Cannabis Industries Australia, but he has also been a director since a month after its first registration. Now you can see here it says current office holders and other roles. Director Dolph Cook. So if there was any doubt about whether Dolph Cook has been telling you the truth that he's no longer a director, he's not involved with CIA Industries, he is still very much involved, very much responsible. He is a director. Now, when Philip Dixon appeared in court last year and said that Dolph Cook was no longer a director, what kind of a, an incompetent director is Philip Dixon that he doesn't even know what's going on in, the, in his own company? I mean, come on. First he says, no, he's not. And then in the next part where he's pushed on it a little bit more, he becomes more vague about it as if, well, I don't know whether he actually did or not kind of thing. So he's contradicted himself in the testimony that he gave in court. Now, uh, if Dolph would like to challenge me on this information, please feel free to contact me. I'll leave a link in the description below. You can PM me at uh, my Facebook page. You can put me straight. You can tell me how this document, this extract from ATSIC that was done in August this year, has still clearly got you listed as a director and a shareholder. And that despite Philip Dixon's assertion that you are not a director anymore, despite your assertions, Dolph Cook, that you are not a director anymore, you are. You are a director, you are a shareholder, you are responsible. And it's that simple. So yes, as I said, if you would like to correct me, Dolph, please feel free. I'll leave a link. You can put me straight. Now, sort of associated with all of this that's been going on, but in kind of not really, <laughs> but it is in some ways, for from some perspectives, a very um, telling point as to why the nightcap on Minjimble development is, uh, oh well, what would you say? It has had nothing but obstacle after obstacle after obstacle. And it is going to continue to have all those obstacles and it will fail miserably. And uh, let me get into a little bit of something here another perspective. The actual area just down from Mount Burrell, next door suburb, well you wouldn't even call it a suburb, it's merely an address that goes from Mount Burrell to Kunga. So basically as you can even see here that um, Dolph Cook is in Kunga. And uh, if you look at it, and I've heard this thing said too, and I know that there are many people in the area that have probably heard about the curse of the land. I know I heard about it when I was out at Chowan Creek from uh, elders of the Bunjalung there that actually told me about the curse. When I asked them about it, um, well let's just say they probably knew as much as what anybody um, generally would know. When I said where did it occur, they didn't even know that. But they were of the impression that even the area at Chowan Creek was cursed as well. I mean, it's not just that little area um, in Kunga that has been specified, but a larger area. So that's just kind of the belief system that even knows that there's that the one story about this curse surrounding the massacre the interpretation of the elders as to where that curse actually applies. Well, the thing I can tell you is that um, 
I know for a fact that the land out at Chowan Creek saved my ass at least three times. It's it's one of those things that you would have to see and be there to witness. And actually, two out of those three events I did have a witness for. So, <laughs> you know, um, they witnessed it as well as me. They experienced the land protecting me from harm, not bringing harm to me. So you could understand that my confusion around the allegation of the curse was not very well understood because if there was a curse, I wasn't getting it. You know, I was getting the opposite end of the scale. It was the land was, it was literally saving me from harm. Because I have to tell you, two of those events, um, I could have well ended up smashing and breaking my hips again. And I could have been in a, oh, a world of pain. And I know if I break my hips again, um, well, let's just say that after the last time, the doctor said I'd be lucky if I walked <laughs> properly again. So, yes, the land saved me. So I'd have to say that I can't find that there's any validation in the curse because the land protected me. But then I did give some thought to the fact, well, maybe it's not a curse on those that are, are connected, that are in sync with the land, that do actually have in their heart, do no harm. See, if you have in your heart, do no harm, you are in balance with the environment you're in. But if you say do no harm, and then you do, well, then you are not in balance with the land. And let's face it, these boys up at Nightcap, even though they're saying they're in, oh, do no harm, it's all about coming back to country and volition and all this other garbage, that's a sales pitch. Adrian Brannock doesn't even live at Nightcap and will never live at Nightcap. He's not going to leave his mansion in Queensland, okay? He might go there for a holiday village if it ever get, gets approved. But it's been knocked back that many times. And the efforts now that are going to come against them is going to ensure that, well, they're not going to have any avenue left. You know, it's... They've virtually come to the stage of exhausting any possibility to even try and con people into believing that there is a hope in hell of ever getting DA approval. And it's funny that I've heard two stories associated with people that have um, actually had grief caused because of natural events that, well, you could say it was just a coincidence or you could say that maybe it's a little bit of the curse coming out. Let's have a look at this curse, shall we? But before I take you to the curse, let me remind you that these are the four directors. Um, well, they were the four directors. These up here, Philip Dixon, and Dolph Cook are now the only two current directors of Cannabis Industries Australia. But all four of these people are shareholders. Adrian Brennock through Nyepi, Mark Darwin through Loved Ones Tribe, Philip Dixon through Dixon Rainmaker. And dear old Dolph, well, Dolph just left it in his name, didn't he? <laughs> seems like the others deliberately created a layer of protection between um, the activities going on in Cannabis Industries Australia and themselves by actually putting the shares in the company's names because that shifts the responsibility directly off them. Dolph Cook is actually the only individual in all of them, um, well, Philip Dixon as director too, but uh, as a shareholder, 
He's the most vulnerable. Anyway, on to the curse. The Kunga curse. Now I know there are going to be pay people that are going to say oh this is absolute rubbish what a, a what a load of stupidity to even think that um, the land could actually <laughs> be cursed but let me just tell you the little things that I've experienced through life that truth is stranger than fiction there is more to life than what we not do what we know about life could fit on a pinhead of a huge great big ball of what we don't know. So to say that um, something can't happen because your mind is so small in perspective actually allows you the uh, um, possibility that in your ignorance you may succumb to that which you don't actually believe because the thing is that with so many things belief is not required okay <laughs> your belief in certain things is not required for them to exist and your disbelief in things does not mean that they don't exist I can tell you that the Aboriginal people believe this to be true and I would also say that there is most definitely some energy in the area but like many that energy is not a bad thing it is a really good thing it is almost blissful it is not a scary fearful thing and from what I've experienced as I explained saved me from harm because I do no harm it allowed that no harm came to me and when I say it I don't know whether it's nature itself whether it's the land whether it's the spirits whether it's the ancestors I don't know all I know is that I had experiences outside of the ordinary and something saved me from a whole lot of hurt and harm. Now people look at these kinds of things when they say that an area could be cursed or anything out of, you know, anything that could be considered supernatural or anything like that. There's such a limited mindset that cannot see, as I just explained, that just because you don't accept it exists, doesn't mean that it does and by other people's perspectives that do understand these things they are putting it in terms of what we best understand this headline up here on the left reads Kunga area cursed court told this is a court that is told about what has happened in this area and how it has cursed the land for it. So let, let's have a look at it. This goes back to December 2008 and if you look at the image here it shows Land and Environment Court Commissioner Tim Moore lays down the law to participants and onlookers at the on-site hearing at Kunga. So I've zoomed it in a bit so that it can be readable, but uh, it's a fairly long article. I won't read all of it. I'll leave a link so that you can have a read of it yourself. An alleged Aboriginal massacre more than a century ago has inspired an ongoing curse covering the site of a proposed village in the shadow of Mount Warning. The tale of slaughter and the subsequent curse inflicting anyone who settles the site was among one of the more macabre submissions to an on-site court inquiry into the controversial project attended by around 100 people. Peter Simons of Birrell Creek told Land and Environment Commissioner Tim Moore that elders of the Bunjalung tribes 
drew on their verbal history several years ago to describe to him in detail how events unfolded in the Rolling River pastures at Kunga before the end of the 19th century. He said the severity of mutilation of the killings disturbed the Aborigines so greatly they lit beacon fires which could be seen from as far as Malanganese, Malangani, sorry, to call on Bunjalong tribes to come to the area to conduct funeral rites and mourning ceremonies for the victims. The clever men, or sorcerers and healers, sat down for three days and three nights and sang a curse on this land, and it was this curse I was picking up. Wow, well, just reading that bit got goosebumps all over me. <laughs> Sorry, sidebar there. Mr. Simons, who described himself as a geopathic stress consultant able to read the energy signatures of properties, told the court and a riveted entourage of city-based legal eagles. So I won't read the rest out. I'll leave that link in the description below so that you can go there directly to it. It's on page two. And uh, I tried downloading, but they won't let you download it. You'll just have to look at it directly on there yourself. Also, interestingly, on the same page is uh, a little thing about Nightcap Village. Now this is back in 2008. This would have been all what Peter Van Leishout was doing with his um, proposal of the Nightcap Village. And at that stage in 2008, he still didn't have approval for the land. He got that in 2009 and that approval lapsed in 2014 and neither well none of the land associated that has been given out by ncv enterprises and in their planet document pdf none of that land whatsoever all those all those addresses has had any approval even lodged to do with anything the only thing that's there is this lapse DA approval, which is very interesting to note that on that DA approval that Peter Van Leishout got, there's a few pages that have actually got um, drawings on there and they have actually been stamped and signed by the council. Now, if you go to the planet document that NCV Enterprises is presenting, that exact same page has been presented signature and all on that page and it is on the basis of all this information that they're providing in this planet document that in the nightcap on Minjimble official documentary where both Adrian Brannock and Richard Moat confirm and say there is pre-existing approval Everything they are saying that is existing as pre-existing approval is lapsed approval that they have pulled out excerpts out of this old lapsed DA that is completely irrelevant to the project now. It's got nothing to do with it. It might have been past a part of what Peter Van Leishout wanted to do, but it's dead and buried. It's gone. It doesn't exist and every attempt to actually get something done they don't the council un, have told them please we are not going to approve multiple occupant multiple occupancy dwellings there it's just not going to happen but they keep trying another disturbing thing that seems to be going on up at nightcap at the moment it seems like, you know that little area that I've pointed out in so many videos where the land is dead looking? Well, it seems like the, it's more than just dead now. It's been bared up. And it looks like too, as um, you see, the boys at NICAP should remind themselves that anyone can drive up the bloody roads around the place and take pictures of what's going on on your hill. 
You know, you, you're pretty silly that, you know, for what you're doing that can actually be photographed by the public just coming along, going up a road and going click. You know, it's all too easy, which is actually what people have done. And I've seen pictures of this. Pictures of where too, that uh, all these excavations and work that's gone on that's completely cleared that side of the hill has also gone down into the 50 metre exclusion zone near the river. Now, being in Tassie, I don't know for a fact that it's been pouring down with rain in northern New South Wales, but I'm hearing it consistently from people that it's been raining for days. So not only is the river really flooded, but all that bared up hillside is just running all that muck down into the Tweed River. And the fact that there's no even 50 metre exclusion zone there now to even buffer that, it's just mud straight down into your drinking water. Ugh. But And this has continued to go on after they've been served notice to stop what they're doing and they think that people aren't watching. Well, I have to tell you that there's more than just the locals in your little area that are locals, you know. There's locals of a larger area, as I said, that can drive by, go to a hill and take a picture and they can see and report what's going on. And there are, well, you know how many people there are in around the hills that could do that. And there are lots of people more and more coming forward that are saying, these people up at Nightcap don't even, when they're told to stop trashing the land and harming the land. Now, it's interesting to note too that the park that they've actually, that, that dead looking part that they've bared up even more, that's the part where they plan, well I guarantee you, they plan to sell the allotments off first. Because they need people to come in that would actually think, well, yeah, I that's close enough to a camp kitchen, uh, toilet and shower facilities and all this stuff that until other stuff got developed. So ultimately, putting everything around the actual homestead down the side of the hill, as I'd shown in previous ones. Hang on, I'll bring that up. All right, so here's a little image down here where my little hand is. See the pink at the bottom? There's the homestead in that blank spot. There's the homestead and the camp kitchen and everything that's along there. And where they've cleared is all around here. I'd have to look back at the photographs. I don't think that there's... I'm not sure about there, but all of this is stripped right down to the river. Uh, they're getting ready to actually make it look like to people these lots are usable um, even making it look like because they've broken soil they've broken ground that surely they've got the approval that they say is pre-existing and they're just going ahead now of course it would be very easy if uh, anyone wants to uh, at nightcap tell me I'm full of shit, fine. I'm open to being corrected. Show me your current pre-approved DA. That's all you have to do, is show me a current DA that shows that there is pre-existing approval, that shows that that matches up with your bloody sales pitch. You're telling us on the Nightcap on Mingimble official video that it is pre-existing approval. Adrian Brennock says that. Richard Moat confirms it. That's all they've got to do. Show the pre-existing approval. And not be using all the stuff in their Planet PDF that has actually come from approval that had lapsed, well, five, six years ago? Six years ago. Six and a half. Oh, five and a half, whatever. A while ago. And as I said, it's a dead duck.
Now, another little interesting sideline is the recent um, revelation that the Mebbin Springs uh, development has been given approval and they've gone ahead. The subdivision, they've first released 20 lots and the whole subdivision is for 70 lots. That's just down the road at 2981 Kyogul Road in Kunga. And, you know, I was um, <laughs> wondering about, because apparently this is supposed to be an exclusive community. It's gated and prices are probably going to be costing you an arm and a leg just to get the land. Oh, there is NBN going in there too, so you won't go without internet and all your modern conveniences. But uh, one thing I bet you they don't tell you about in the sales spill, if you're buying into the Mebbin Springs Number no. 9 Proprietary Limited, <laughs> um, the land comes with a curse. And if you're not coming at it with the right kind of heart, you could find that the land's going to bite you back. And I know that there are people out there that can't understand that concept and think, oh, that's stupid. But, you know, it's a warning to the wise. Only fools will not heed it, okay? I'm not interested in fools. I mean, <laughs> you're going to make mistakes anyway. Just for those that actually are, have got a little bit more going on in the open mind and what the broader range of what exists around us. I mean, you look at it. We exist in space. You can't see it. Inside your body, you can't see it, yet you know that your body is what's inside that you can't see is actually making you work. And even smaller with what you can't see are germs that make you sick and that can kill you. So you have to remember that just because you can't see something or understand it doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. And I suppose on that, I'm going to leave this video and catch you on the next one. <laughs> Bye.